The aviation industry is seeing more and more people transitioning into second careers as pilots, controllers, mechanics, and even content creators. So where did they come from? What were they doing before? What made them realize and chase their dreams? We find that out right here on Fly the Transition. Welcome everyone to episode one of Fly the Transition, where we explore the journey of those making the leap into a new career in aviation. I am your host, Jim Schilling, and I'm so glad that you've taken some time out of your day to join me for this new episode. So today we'll be talking to Scott. Scott is a professional pilot flying under a Part 135 private charter operation. But it took Scott into his 40s before he was able to realize his dream of a career in aviation. After a successful career in the energy sector, Scott was finally able to realize his dreams. He shares that story with all of us on Fly the Transition. So I've known Scott for a number of years now. We are part of the same flying club at our local airport, and most recently, he has been housing his Beechcraft Baron in the same hangar that I have, the Beechcraft Sundowner, a hangar affectionately known as the Beach House, for obvious reasons. So Scott, for me, is a fitting guest for the first episode of this podcast because he's part of the inspiration for this podcast. I've known that Scott had made this transition into aviation later in his professional life, and I've been intrigued by those stories. So I was really excited that Scott agreed to come onto the podcast and be my first guest. Scott grew up around aviation, but it wasn't something that he went into as a profession until his mid-40s. Between flying with his father and his love of RC aviation, the passion has always been there. But in a not-so-unfamiliar tale, Scott started and stopped his pilot training several times before finally achieving his certificate. Scott started a family and a successful career in the energy sector, but he still longed for a career in flying. So today, we talk about that journey into that career to aviation, the struggles he faced, the pandemic, and his advice for those who wish to follow the same path. So Scott's introduction into aviation begins with his father, who was also a pilot. And at a young age, Scott was bit by the aviation bug. My dad uh, was a private pilot, achieved his private pilot's license. And I think I started flying with my dad in a 152, uh, about four years old. I vaguely remember as a child standing up while we were flying, holding onto the yoke and trying to look over the glare shield. Oh, wow. You know, and, and as I grew up, I my dad got better with his ability to fly and progressed onto a 172. And I remember flying in that airplane. And then he ended up uh, joining the Civil Air Patrol and getting into that. And it just it just kept going from there. So I got started into aviation itself. I also got started into model aviation at a really young age, too. My dad helped me build my first RC airplane at 14 years old. And I learned how to fly that at a RC club. And at 51 years old, I'm still doing that today because I love it. Nothing wrong with that. Met a lot of great people in aviation as a result of RC aviation, too. You know, because of my dad um, and, and my my passion was growing in the aviation, I started flying uh, when I was about 16 years old. It was around 1988 when I started. My dad had a, a good friend that owned a fixed base operation in McCook, Nebraska. You know, they got to talk in and I was really getting interested in, in aviation. Had a summer coming up off of school. My dad's buddy offered to have me come out. Worked at his FBO for the summer, fueling airplanes and, you know, doing the, the hangar chores, sweeping and, and fueling aircraft and things like that. And I got my start doing that. And as my payment uh, for doing that, then I was able to get some flight lessons. Uh, I spent the summer doing flight lessons with my dad's my dad's friend flying uh, Beechcraft Sports and occasionally a Sundowner. You know, as a, as a kid and as much as I loved the airplanes, and at that time I'd already been flying RC airplanes for a couple of years too, it's all I wanted to do. I thought for sure, I'm going to the airlines, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a pilot no matter what. It's just always been my passion, but uh, you know, life progresses and sometimes it always doesn't go that way right off the bat. I didn't finish my flying it when I was out there in McCook uh, working with them. I, you know, I flew for that summer and a little bit after that, but I was young, still in high school, and my dad, quite frankly, was was paying my way, you know, for flight lessons after that. And I uh, wasn't quite squared away enough to really take it on seriously um, at that point in life. So we oh, just sure. decided that I'd wait a little bit longer. 
It's a tale that I've heard countless times in talking with people who get into aviation. Those who start their training, and for one reason or another, aren't able to complete it. Scott was in that same boat, a young man who by his own admission wasn't squared away enough to get the job done. For many, the story ends right here. But Scott tried again. And again. The third time being the charm, he finally got his pilot certificate. I started flying again in, I think, 93. Started flying a 152 out of, out of Lake Elmo Airport. And that's where I ended up doing my first solo. I soloed there in 93. And uh, then quit shortly after that, after my solo. Again, not finishing. Uh, and I think it was, again, young and hanging out with friends and, quite honestly, doing the written test and taking the written, getting that completed. A lot of people get hung up on that, and I think that was part of the, the issue back then. But at that point in life, I still wasn't quite squared away enough. And even though I had this passion for aviation, you have to stick with it. So, and I just was, I just wasn't ready. So oh, I, sure. I backed off again. And also, it was a financial thing at that point. The job that I had at that time just really didn't, you know, allow me to continue with flight school consistently. And I wasn't moving forward because of that. So I, I just took another break until I was had a little bit more time and money to work on it. Yeah, I decided to pick it up one more time, and this time it stuck. There are times of charm, as they say. Yeah, and solo, like I said, in '93, and quitting. Right around 94. I met my wife in 95, and we dated for years. I started a new career in the electrical field. Started with that. As that progressed, we're starting a family, too, which wasn't really the greatest time, but I resumed flying again in November 2003, and uh, I did that at Anoka County Airport, and it didn't take very long after that point because I had quite a bit of flight training before that. I was still flying the RC airplanes, and I still had this burning passion for it. So I, it went pretty quick to get soloed again. So I, I did end up soloing again uh, in December of 2003 and just kind of continued on with it and completed my private pilot check ride in uh, May of 2004. From, from then on, I uh, just stayed with it. At times, I would only fly maybe once every three months just to stay current. Yeah. At the time, Sandy and I both had two two young boys going. We had, had two kids uh they were very young, and that financial burden got in the way a little bit, but I stuck with it. There was times that, that I thought, well, maybe I should quit just because I'm not staying current, and that's not always the safest thing to do. And uh, my wife encouraged me to stick with it. She didn't want me to quit. Talked me into stay with it. It'll get better, and it did. So while Scott was raising a family and working towards his pilot ratings, he was also building a very successful career in the limited energy field a field that Scott will be able to explain far better than I ever could. And as he climbed the ladder in that career field, through the help of a supportive company, he was able to mix aviation and his professional career to start building hours. I went into the uh, limited energy side of the electrical field. I had a good friend of mine that was a uh, inside wireman for the local IBW 292 out of Minneapolis. And at that time, I had uh, Originally had a small passion for cars too, which I still do today. And my dad used to drag race too, and so I I started working on cars early on, and I just decided that that really that really wasn't going to be the way I wanted to go. And a friend of mine told me about what he was doing, and I looked into it and found out that the limited energy side was really intriguing to me because of what it entails, uh, the communication side, the fiber optic work. And I, and I did all of it in that career, in that field. I did everything from voice data through security, video surveillance, access control, fire alarm things. But I took that career from cradle to grave, from an apprentice to a technician to a journeyman, a general, you know, a, a foreman, general foreman. Then I went into, you know, project management, estimating design and account management at the latter end of it. So, but that career kick-started my aviation, too, because I was able to afford to work on my ratings at that point. When I was into, um, in the limited energy side, I, I was in the, uh, on the commercial side. Uh, you have commercial, and then you also have the residential side. Um, but I, I did everything for, you know, um, corporations, um, whether it be corporations or manufacturing, anything like that, for fire alarm systems, um, within their buildings or access control, you know, their badge access to let people in, video surveillance, which is, which got huge um, by the time I was getting out. It's it's just a huge part of the industry now with 
the crime and theft, unfortunately, that we deal with on an everyday basis. But the inside wiremen, they used to do that work, but it got so specialized that the industry kind of broke off from the, what the inside wiremen were doing and then the limited energy side guys were doing. So we specialized in the, the fiber optic work and the low voltage work, if, if you will. I did that for about 23 years. You know, I started as an apprentice in the field and took it all the way through to account management at the, uh, the back end. In the latter part of that career, when I was in the account management side, I was actually using the aviation um, occasionally to go see my customers. Okay. The owner of the company allowed me to do that. Now, it was completely on my own. The aircraft and, and what I was doing had no affiliation to, the, to my business, whatever. I was literally just flying myself to see the customers. I never took anybody with me. It was just getting solo time, paying for my fuel, all that. But it allowed me to build some time also, getting some good cross-country time under my belt. Um, and by that time, I had achieved my instrument rating by then too. So that that helped with, uh, you know, longer cross countries. And I didn't do anything real, you know, too far. I'd do the five state area in the Midwest up here from um, Minnesota, Michigan. Went out to Milwaukee quite a bit. North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. But past that, I if I had to go any further than that, I would I would jump on the airlines. But when it worked, when the weather was decent and within my capability of doing it. I used it to my advantage, and it and it worked out really well. The owner of the company I used to work for is a fantastic guy, and allowed me to do that and helped me with with uh, kickstart and this other side of um, my career. So, how did Scott go from a successful career in the limited energy field to finding his break in the aviation industry? Well, a series of great networking opportunities and perseverance certainly played a part. But with any major life change, there was a degree of uncertainty as he left his old career behind. Well, I never really knew that I was going to make it for sure. Um, I always knew that I wanted to. The thing with making the switch was, you know, you're, you've got a good career going, the pay is good, and to get into an entry-level uh, flying job, if you will, when you're late 40s, it's something that always intrigued me, something I always wanted to do, but didn't know if I could actually do it. It was a tough decision, and it was a, a decision that uh, my wife and I talked to at length you know, the pros and cons and, you know, what could potentially happen. And we had to get ourselves ready for that if I did get hired on and then laid off right away, which actually happened <laughs> uh, when COVID happened, right? Yeah, you I know, suppose. The owner of the company knew that this has always been what I wanted to do. He knew that it was my passion. We had talked about it at length. I, I want to fly someday. And we just, I just had to make it happen. Um, finally got to a point and um, started throwing uh, resumes out there and talking to people and honestly networking with people. I think that's the, the biggest thing somebody can, an individual can do. Make friends out there and it, it, pilots are easy to make friends with, most of them, right? 98% of them, I would say. And I did that. I didn't have a lot of time. You know, um, I only had about 650 hours when I was trying to do this. And that's, that's low time to go work for a charter operation or anything like that. So uh, it's a, it's tough to break in there. So you kind of need to know somebody in that case. I wasn't a candidate for the airlines, of course, because I wasn't out of a 141 flight school or anything like that. So I needed to have, you know, 1,500 hours in an ATP to start look, knocking on those doors. So that wasn't even, even close to an option. But um, I didn't always know that I could do it, but I thought I'd give it a, a heck of a try. While I was still working as an account manager... Uh, at the limited energy company I was working for, I started putting out resumes and started, to, you know, and, and networking with people. There's kind of a fun story behind this too, because the owner of the company was all for it. And I told him that I was putting out resumes. Uh, I wasn't hiding anything from him because he was a good friend of mine. And, you know, if something were to happen, I didn't want a, anything to be a big surprise to him that I'm, I'm all of a sudden jumping ship after being with, with him for so long. The way it came about, uh, it sent out, multiple resumes a couple do like boutique airlines because on their websites they they would take us a, a commercial guy with an instrument rating obviously with single engine as they said on their website but i never heard back and i applied for them three times and at that time i i was racking up multi-engine baron time too and how it happened for me how i landed my first job was uh, i was out at my rc club Back to the RC stuff again and how it it really helps you. 
um, or it can. Um, I'm back at the RC, RC Club, and one of my good buddies that I fly with out there um, is a Delta 737 captain. We'd flown together several times, multiple times. It, he actually uh, helped me obtain my high performance rating in a 182. So he knew how I flew, and he knew I flew RC airplanes, and he and I instruct people at our club on how to fly RC airplanes. And he was trying to talk me into uh, being a CFI, which is still on my bucket list. I just haven't done that yet. What happened from there was he went to an uh, RC aircraft auction that we go to every single year. It's a big auction in Bloomington, Minnesota. We go to it. And I didn't go that year because my son had a hockey tournament and, and you know, family first, right? So I go to the hockey tournament. I don't go to the RC auction. And my buddy goes to this and runs into an ex-co-worker, Delta captain, who had retired from Delta. And they get to talking. And he says, hey, you know, what are you doing nowadays? And his buddy says, well, you know, uh, you, I'm not really retired anymore. I, I'm back to work. I'm, I'm flying again. Um, I'm actually flying King Airs, flying part 135 charter for something to do. Because the 135, as long as you can keep your medical and, you know, up to, up to snuff, you, you're good to go. Whereas in the airlines at 65, you know, they, you got to start looking for something else to do. So yeah. he didn't really need the money, but he was passionate about aviation, wanted to continue on. As that conversation progressed, my friend told me, says, look, I know a guy that's really trying to get into this. What, what would it take for him to get into what you're doing? And he said, well, how much time does he have? And he said, I think he's got 600 and some odd hours. Well, have him give us a call. That started the whole, the whole process. We swapped some contact information and I uh, made some phone calls, and my buddy's friend got me in touch with the chief pilot at this 135 operation out of Flying Cloud, and um, the rest is history, really. I mean, it was it didn't come right away, though. I got to tell people that, too. It's, it's, um, it took about three and a half months. They asked me to come in right away. I met with them, and we walked around uh, the hangars. They let me sit in all their air, airplanes. They actually introduced me to people that were the line crew, the mechanics, uh, maintenance, uh, even the owner. And I thought, wow, this is great. I'm, I'm going to get a job right away. So we sit back down. We're kind of shooting the breeze. And, and this chief pilot doesn't say, hey, well, you want to come aboard? And so I throw the question out there. And he says, well, you know, we just brought on three first officers a few weeks ago. So we don't need anybody right now. But make sure you stay in touch. Okay. So I left there with my tail between my legs because I went from high to a low because I thought, oh, I'm, I'm finally in, but not quite. But again, my wife comes to my rescue and says, well, don't get discouraged, you know, stick with it. And, and it's my nature too. And I did. And I, what I did is I went, I went back to that 135 operation once a month just to show face. Hey, guys, you know, what I asked for the chief pilot. He'd come down, hey, how you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Are you? I just want to let you know I'm still very interested in flying. If a position opens up, please give me a call. So as time moves on, it was another three months, as a matter of fact, after that. And I didn't think it was going to happen. Another position at my company, the low voltage company I was working for, came my way. And it was a little bit less stressful position, which I kind of needed at that point. I was, I was pretty full at that time with what I could handle at work with bids and, and running projects and things like that. And I needed a break. My, my buddy, the owner knew I needed a break and he kind of created another position that I th thought would be a really good fit. I wasn't getting positive feedback from the 135 operation. I accepted the job. I said, well, I'll, I'll take it. Well, it was a Wednesday afternoon. I'm sitting there at home about four 30 after I got home from work and email communication just went out to my company saying, Hey, Scott's going to take this new position. We're excited to have him do this. He's going to be a great fit and all that. Five minutes later, my phone rings. It's the director of operations for the, from this 135 company. Hey, Scott, wondering if you still want to come fly for us. My answer right away was absolutely. I, for sure. He says, well, that's great. Can you come in tomorrow and uh, pick up some paperwork and go take a drug test? I said, sure, I can do that. No problem. I hang up the phone going, well, now I'm in a predicament. I just accepted a job with, you know, with a 135 company, and I just accepted a new position at my, yeah. my limited energy co the company I used to work for. Because I was communicating, and I was out front with, with the owner of the company, the next phone call I made was to him. I didn't call my 
immediate boss, I called him and he picked up the phone. I said, Hey buddy, I said, uh, you'll never guess what just happened. And he said, you got a call to go fly, didn't you? I said, I did. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what, you got to do it. You got to do it. I know that's what you want to do. You have to take it. I know you've been trying. Don't worry about us here. We'll be fine. And um, if anything falls through, you let me know you've always got a job here. So for me, I was on cloud nine at that point because I had just been offered a job at a 135 operation to fly professionally. I'm finally getting to do what I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. My buddy and my old job are letting me go gracefully. And I think it's partially because I, I play how I played that, but I knew I was backstop too. If anything happened, I could go back to doing that and I haven't looked back. So Scott had finally made his break into a part 135 operation and a professional flying job. Before we go too much further though, let's talk about part 135. And before you tune out, no, I don't plan on just making this a boring lesson on regulations. Part 135 of the Federal Aviation Regulations is simply set out as operating requirements for commuter and on-demand operations. This typically only applies to aircraft that have fewer than 30 seats and a maximum payload of about 7,500 pounds. Most private jets actually fall within this regulation. For those of you out there chasing your 1,500 hours to make the airlines, Part 135 is a little bit different. They require pilots to have a minimum of 500 hours of total flight time, 100 hours of cross-country flight time, and 25 hours of night cross-country flight time. So this can cover a wide variety of different types of flying, from flying tours, hauling passengers, and even cargo. But where Scott starts is on-demand medical flying, with operations flying doctors and organs to different places. He tells us about his time flying the King Air, and the invaluable experience he gained from those he flew with. Well, there's a lot of different 135 jobs out there. There's several different types of flying that these 135 guys are doing. So my first job was a um, on-demand 135. Okay. We were doing uh, quite a bit of medical. Fair portion of the business was um, organs, doctors, uh, family coordinators, things like that. Um, so the mission was fantastic. It was probably the best experience I could have I could have got. To be good, to be completely candid, because of the type of the flying that they were doing, and the type of captains that they had, the guy that got me into this was a retired Delta captain. So it was he and several of his retired Delta captain buddies that were alongside of him doing this. So they're flying these King Airs and beach jets, and I learned from some of the best. You know, we flew a lot at night. We flew in all kinds of weather. My my first uh, my first year getting into it, you know, I started flying with them. I think it was like in October or so. So I jumped right into winter. And my after going through training and getting checked out in the in the in a King Air, first couple of trips, I'm I'm blasting off into icing into stuff that I've really not done a whole lot of. I've been into some very very light icing before flying the Baron, but man, I was out of there in a heartbeat, you know, because I just didn't know anything about it. I was quite frankly scared of it, rightly so. You know, you got to be careful with that. But um, I flew with these guys and they knew what they were doing. Uh, I felt extremely safe. I They taught me, you know, you think these guys that have 30 plus thousand hours would be a little bit snooty. Hey, you know, you've got 650 hours and I've got 35. Not at all. These guys were some of the nicest, most polite people I've ever met. They taught me. They taught me well how to fly weather, um, all the way from the flying capabilities right through um, communications, right? How to properly phrase things uh, on the radio. And there's, it's helped me out tremendously. So that, that flying was, um, again, like I said, I, I learned more there than I think that I could have learned any place else. And it prepared me for, for the career. I think that it's very beneficial for people, young people, and, and, and even older people our age. If they want to make a career switch like that, if they don't have a lot of weather flying background, don't be afraid of going to fly, you know, King Airs or something like that. You don't need to be in a jet right away because the fact of the matter is you'll probably be hanging out of the tail anyway, you know, once you get into a jet if you haven't flown something like a King Air. I mean, it's just, it's a stepping stone. I remember going from, you know, when I went in for, it went from a 
from a Piper Warrior into an Arrow. It's like, okay, I got more things to think about. Yeah. I got the props, <laughs> I got the gear, and it's faster. And you know, and then then they start flying a Baron. It's like, oh boy, now I got two engines, and you're going quite a bit faster. And this thing doesn't like to slow down. And you know, it's it it's all relative, right? Baby steps. Take it a little bit at a time. At this particular company, the the airplanes, the King Airs that I was flying were. 90s and 200s um, so they don't require a type rating so they did their training for those aircraft in-house so you fly right seat for quite a while you'll you'll fly right seat and you'll fly empty legs right seat repositioning legs till the captain feels that your skill set is such that you can handle flying with anybody on board and then somewhere down the line you get moved over to the left seat and you start flying left seat you're still not the pic on the trip you're not the captain um, because in the 135 world, at least the one I was with, because of the, the on-demand 135, you still had to have a an ATP, 1,500 hours in an ATP in order to act as PIC um, captain. I shouldn't say PIC. I could get PIC time, but I couldn't act as the captain. Okay, I sure. would get PIC, you know, flying left seat in the airplane all the time, but it wouldn't be the assigned captain on the trip until after the, after the um, ATP. So that was the kind of the stepping stone um, throughout that. In about three years' time doing that, I built about 875 hours Dang. in King Airs. And like I said, and a lot of it was all night flying, thunderstorm stuff. You know, you just use day stuff mixed in there, but a lot of medical stuff happens at night. I built eight, 875 hours of, of some really good training, a really good flying, uh, before they offered me a, a spot in one of their beach jets. You know, of course, I jumped right on that. So then I get sent to school for my first type rating. So that was kind of a daunting task, okay. but it went well. It's, a, it's another airplane. Is You have to study and keep your wits together. You'll get through it. So Scott was well on his way. After racking up hundreds of hours and gaining some great experience, it was time for his first type rating. So what was Scott's company looking for? And what did that process look like? They were looking for close to 1,000 hours of, tur you know, of turbine time before they wanted to send me into, into the jet. I don't know if that's consistent with everybody else out yeah. there or not, but that's what this company was was looking for. And 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 honestly, to, also I was kind of waiting my turn. There were other guys that were uh, ahead of me that were being upgraded. Right? I think I could have been sent to school sooner than that, but I waited <laughs> my turn. Tactfully, don't feel like I should be in front of anybody else, unless of course they don't show up for work. But uh, the school was um, again for me being a first type rating. It was kind of like, um, how, should I, how should I phrase it? It was kind of like Groundhog's Day. You'd spent three weeks in a hotel room studying. It's to the schoolhouse every day, right? And then you do that for a week and a half, two weeks of classroom studying. And you do, a, you know, of course, like every other thing you do with aviation, there's a written involved, right? You do you do your written. Yeah. You know, the written is, isn't as hard, I don't think, as is a as a private pilot or certainly an instrument rating um, written test, it's more of aircraft systems and uh, limitations and things like that, right? You just need to know the airplane, really, and that's mostly what that's about. So you do that, and then it's off to the sim. Now, the sim, you know, for me, I go from flying King Airs, which are, you know, they're no slouch airplanes, but they're not a jet, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I went from... Feeling pretty confident flying King Airs to kind of holding on to the tail again in the sim. I mean, the first few few days in the sim, like holy cow, you know, this is a whole different, whole different deal. And you know, you're flying sims that are, I I think somebody told me at the the school that they're like thirty million dollars for these simulators. Oh, they, wow. they cost more than the airplane does. They because of what they do. The simulator is it's a complete mock up of the actual cockpit. Every switch is in the exact same spot. Everything works. It's so that. It makes sense that they're that much, but oh, sure. you do all your flight training in the sim, and it's hard work. You, they do put you through the ringer because they have to. In the latter stages of your sim training, you, you're doing things like V1 cuts and thrust reverser deployments on after V1, the things that you just would never even consider doing in a real airplane on purpose, you know, because they're that dangerous, right? So sure. they yeah. throw it at you in the sim and they do it over and over and over again. They knock you in the head. You walk out of the simulator and you need to guzzle two bottles of water because your mouth is dry, you know, you know, so you're just that talented and it, you know, you were that good at it. You know, I guess some people probably are, but you know, it, for me, it was a little bit of work, but I got through it. 
you know, be, getting the first type rating. There's two ways to do it. Some of the uh, guys that were in my class were, were getting an SIC type. You can actually get an SIC type, which is all the same classroom training, but a little bit less on the check ride. You don't have okay. to do as many approaches. You don't have to do some of the other maneuvers that you, you have to do as a PIC type check. So with the PIC type check, it goes all the way back to your infancy. I mean, you're doing all all three different all different kinds of stalls, right? Clean stalls, approach stalls, departure stalls. You're doing uh, steep turns. So it's, it's a lot of work, but uh, you come out of there feeling pretty good. And honestly, for me, I came out of training, uh, went to work. They said, "Okay, here you go. We got a trip for you." And the first time I flew that Hawker 400, you know, right out of the sim was in the left seat. You know, so, you know, with a very capable and um, experienced captain, of course, but it went well, whether you're going to flight safety or, or uh, CAE, these companies, they, their training is good. You come out of there prepared. That's how it goes. Um, that's how the training goes. Uh, you, you go in there with a little bit of nerves and then it's hard work for two or three weeks, sometimes four, depending, sometimes even longer than that, depending on the airplane, right? Some of the guys that I I work with now, their, their initial training for a new type on some of these bigger airplanes can be three weeks to a month or more wow. on some of these because of what they are to fly. But, you know, you come out of there and you're really excited and, and you get yourself a new type rating on your certificate. So it's uh, it, it's almost like, uh, you know, the day after you get your instrument rating, it's like, all right, you know, here we go. To those of us that are into this aviation the way we are, it's it's not hard to get excited about doing this kind of stuff. Totally agree. So Scott's landed himself a great job flying. He's doing what he loves, he's flying with exceptionally qualified pilots, and he's learning a ton. But what came next nearly made him lose that career he had worked so hard to achieve. So I started with my first 135 company, I think it was October of 2019. Okay. So it was only a few months, and COVID hits. And I get a phone call from the director of operations. He says, well, we're going to have to furlough you because we don't know what this is doing the medical people are shutting down. They're not going to be doing any um, organs or anything like that for, for now until we figure out what's going on. And I was new. I was a low man on a totem pole. You know, I wasn't dual qualified in two different airplanes. So out I go. Well, I kept an eye on FlightAware. Uh -huh. I kept an eye on the company. I stayed in touch with the company. In fact, I stayed in touch with them as much as every couple of weeks I was calling them. Um, just saying, Hey, how you doing? How are things going? And stuck with that same program. Like when I got hired, told them that if things loosen up, I'll work part-time, I'll work contract, reduced rate, whatever I can do to get my foot back in the door. Because there were several of us that got laid off. So I kind of thought I've got to do something to put myself out there a little bit above the rest. If I want to get back in there, if I want to get back in there at all at this point, because the COVID thing was going to come back slow as it did. So by staying with it and uh, communicating with that company, I, it paid off because I started flying contract with them. Again, they called me in a flight contract and I would fly with them maybe once, you know, once a week, sometimes twice a week, sometimes not at all during that week. But it finally picked back up and then uh, they brought me back on full time in January, I think, of uh, the next year. It was so it was it, it took some time uh, before I was able to get back into the, the, the seat full time. Yeah, it was it, I mean, it was a layoff. I mean, it right. Um, I was not in, I was not employed anymore with that company and they didn't know. Nobody had any idea with the COVID. They, nobody knew what was going to happen. Aviation's that way. You can have certain events that happen and it shuts down, right? Right. And it's happened to, I, I've talked to pilots all the time that, hey, this is aviation. It's volatile. This this is what, these things happen. I've been laid off several times, economy, whatever. When you go from a, a good paying job in a, a career of over 20 years to take the leap to go fly airplanes, you're kind of sticking your neck out there. Yeah. You know, as an, old, as an older guy, right, that has some sticks in the fire, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to take the leap. But- you know, you don't get anywhere unless you try. And it's something that, you know, the, this whole thing for me was I'll be kicking myself when I'm too old to do it, that I never tried it, that I never went for it. 
because I'm just that passionate about it. Airplanes are everything to me. Uh, I go back to, you know, my wife uh, supporting me. We got to wait this thing out. Just hang tough. Yeah. We talked about it at length financially. What's the drop dead on this thing, right? Okay. If this doesn't come back by X date, then we're going to have to make my call back to my old company or do something, right? I'm, I'm not a lazy guy, you know, and I, I would get something going for myself, um, no matter what, but, um, we decided it was going to be the first of the year. Wow. <laughs> we decided, um, and it, it was, there was literally like a week before I was going to pull the pen and go get another job, um, that I got hired back on. Try to keep my chin up. You know, my wife was supporting me with it, which is huge, right? I mean, it's, it's scary for her. Um, but you know, she had gone through several different job transitions and changes where when you're making a job transition, sometimes you gotta, you take a step back as it relates to pay. Oh, to sure. Take a couple steps forward in pay. Yeah. You got to look at the long game. Okay. Well, if I start here, it's kind of like with the aviation thing, I'm starting at the bottom, but once I get a good foothold in this thing and I've got 10 years under my belt, you know, I'm going to be making dang good money, you know, doing this or the potential there is, is really good. So that's how I stayed motivated. My wife just, you know, we talked about it. She supported it. We were in a financial position where we could do it and take the lumps while I was laid off and, uh, it all worked out. I'm glad I stuck with it. So Scott was able to stick with it due in large part to his perseverance and his support system at home. So where's Scott now with his flying? I moved on from the on-demand 135 and the King Air and uh, Hawker flying, kind of primarily because of the schedule. The company I was flying for was a good company. Great people there. Like I said, learned a lot. But um, another opportunity came my way. Again, networking. Friends of friends, people you know, doing the right thing, treat, treating people the right way, being humble. You know, I'm not God's gift to aviation. I never put myself out as that. There's no S on my chest, even though my name is Scott. There's no, you know, I'm not a super pilot. I make mistakes just like everybody else. And I'm, I'm humble, I'm accountable. You know, I have thick skin. You can tell me that I did something wrong and I'm not going to take it the wrong way. I'll say yes, sir, and move on from there. And um, I think that really helped me with the networking and companies that are going to hire somebody or looking for somebody like that. And also, my customer skills that I learned from the electrical world as being an account manager, right? So, you know, people recognize my customer skills with, with the 135. And what I'm doing now with the 135 job I'm doing now is primarily um, private and corporate. We don't do any of the um, medical stuff where I'm okay. flying now. So, and it's, it's very important to present yourself well, dress well, stay clean, you know, nice, tight, clean uniforms, play the part. You know, that's what these companies are looking for. It makes a big difference. You got to make sure you're presenting yourself well. Think about that. If you're going to go get, get yourself a job flying, that you got you to gotta present yourself well. So Scott's been able to transition from a successful career in the energy sector to now a fairly successful career in aviation. So what advice does he have for those who are looking to make the same leap? Networking. Don't be afraid to go to aviation events. If you, if you belong to a flying club, go to those, those, uh, those events with your flying club, talk to people, the flying club that I belong to. I also belong to a flying club. Uh, we have airline pilots there that are flying there. You know, you're talking to these folks and they know people, right? A lot of what's going on in aviation today, you know, the, the airlines are hiring a lot of young people that have the 1500 hours and the ATPs cause they need people that badly, but you still can't ever discount knowing somebody, you know, the old adage of it's about who, you know, and a lot of times that's the case. I can tell you one of the companies I've worked for, that is the case where they really don't hire off the street. They, they really want to have some sort of knowledge of the person that they're going to be bringing on. So in other words, somebody vouches for you, right? Somebody yeah. within there said, yeah, this is a good guy. He'll do a good job. He's a good pilot. He'll show up. He's clean. He's, you know, doesn't have a, you know, he doesn't have a problem with cocktails or anything like that, you know? So, uh, that's one thing, networking, making sure that you stay out in front of people, your appearance, of course. And other than that, you know, it's, it's really, you know, your, your skills and your time and what you're rated in, um, in the 135, some of the 135 stuff is all turbine, right? So 
like for me it was the King Air and it's multi-engine. There are, there are 135 outfits out there that are single engine uh, and even and even piston powered stuff. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have turbine time to get in there. So don't don't let that hold you back because I didn't. I you know I was I had I had 160 75 hours something like that in a Baron uh, when I got my first job flying King Air turbines. They sure. train you, you know. It's a but you know keep good track of your time. Have good log books. Make sure you haven't padded anything because they'll know. They'll they'll know. It's I, I, one of the guys at at uh, the my my first type rating said to me, you know we we can we can tell who's been in here that might have padded their 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 log book, you know, because they don't fly like they they right, got that many right. hours, you know. So it's um, you know, not that too many people that are pilots do that because I think, again, the fraternity of people that are pilots are honest people and aren't going to do something like that. It's well, I think to your point of if you're padding your log book and it shows obviously to these guys that are the pros, the only one you're cheating doing that is yourself. Oh yeah. You're setting yourself up for maybe a little bit more absolutely opportunity for failure than someone who actually put those hours. Oh yeah. And you will fail. I'm telling you right now, you put yourself out there as somebody that's got all this experience and you don't, it's going to show right away and you might even hurt yourself or somebody else. You yeah. Know, getting yourself in a weather. We can go right back to when I started, you know, flying King Airs, um, in the weather and at night, man, I'll tell you, I learned and I, I learned a lot. You just sit there with your mouth shut and you watch what's going on. I mean, of course you have a job to do as an SIC. You're, you're running checks, you're, you're on the radios, but you're watching what these guys are doing. You're watching how much ice is building and when it's getting popped and, you know, what you're doing to get out of the ice, right? Yeah. And not just sit there and fly around in it. I mean, it's, there's a- aviation, you, you can't substitute your experience. It's just, it'll, it'll come out, it'll bite you, it'll haunt you. If you are not proficient and you don't have the, the experience that you say you do, it's going to show up quick. Right. I'm not cocky whatsoever. I'm careful, but I'm confident. You know, I fly enough that I'm, I'm proficient and, um, I make sure I do that even in the Baron that I fly. Um, I just three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I went and grabbed my, my dad who still holds a medical and is rated in the airplane. And I did almost four hours of hood time in one day. I've, I've told a couple of my, um, coworkers flying on trips lately that I've, that I've done this and I go, what are you crazy? Why would you do that to yourself? Well, because I fly my, my family in that airplane and I don't fly it that often. And I need to be proficient, you know, yep. with um, with uh, going missed from a fully configured and a Baron. You go missed, and you make a mistake on your go around. And let's face it, a lot of people that's where they end up in trouble with is with a botched go around, right? So they're memory items, muscle memory, right? Memory items up here, muscle memory for sure. You know, on w- what you're going to do next, and button pushing. You know, I've got a Garmin 530 in the Baron that I'm fairly proficient with and I know fairly well, but you know what? I'm flying an FMS at work. My first missed approach, I go to transition the, you know, to sequence the box and I missed a button push. I knew where the missed, you know, my, my published missed point was, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any guidance to go there um, because I simply didn't hit the suspend button the uns- to unsuspend the box. Yep. How many of us have won that? <laughs> That goes back to the proficiency. Right. So if you're going to get a job to be proficient, you know, as proficient as you can, if you're trying to fly on what you have in your bank account and you're young, it's tough to stay very proficient doing that. I have heard recently a, a little bit of talk about some of the young people that are coming out of, um, are coming on to, let's say the airlines are into 135 that are five, 600, 700 hour CFIs, young, younger, younger people that have spent the last couple of years building their time, basically flying around the pattern in VMC in a 172 and, right. and stuff like that. And, um, they struggle quite frankly, um, with keeping up with, um, the airplane for one, because of the speeds, uh, and two, um, with their instrument skills, to be honest with you, in some cases, you know, because they're, they're so used to flying around VMC and not actually flying the, the, the IMC themselves, you know what I mean? So stay proficient. So Scott was able to take his love of aviation and turn it into a new career. It's a love that he developed as a child flying with his father. 
and an exploring RC aircraft. And what I thought was really cool is it came full circle with his RC aircraft hobby, as it helped him get into the 135 program in the first place. Because really, Scott wouldn't have known about that 135 job or gotten that opportunity if it had not been for that networking he did with his RC club. There's another really important trait here we should talk about that helped Scott springboard into this career, and that's his perseverance. Now, there wasn't a job readily available for him when he first went and checked out that 135 operation, but he was persistent. He continued to make contact, he continued to build relationships, and it paid off in the long haul. And that same perseverance and persistence helped him when COVID hit as well. Even though he was laid off, he maintained contact with the company, continued to show his interest to get back to work, and ultimately, that helped him get back into the air. Now, here's the important part for those of you who are either student pilots or thinking about making a career transition yourself. Just because Scott's dad started him out in aviation at four years old doesn't mean he just had an easy path and just walked into the airlines as his first career. In fact, it took him three attempts to get through private pilot training. And you know what? That's okay. Our success, or sometimes lack thereof, is based on where we're at in life. And Scott was able to start a successful career in the energy sector, which ultimately helped him build the ratings and the time he needed, as well as some great customer service skills that have helped him be successful in 135 operations. So as we wrap up this episode of Fly the Transition, I want to give a huge thank you to Scott for being my first guest and for being part of the inspiration of this podcast through your story. If you have a story that you'd like to share or if you'd like to give me some feedback, you can email me at flythetransition at gmail.com or you can find me on Facebook at the link in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode and we'll see you next time.